disappears and the scene changes. And to me, that's the beauty of shade gardening, and especially gardening with these ephemeral plants. Here's another one in the Great Smoky Mountains. This is one of the scorpion weeds, or phacelias, a biennial plant that seeds, rises, blooms, and completely disappears. <coughs> and then in a garden, I told you I don't have that kind of restraint. This is my garden, and the tapestry on the forest floor. But I try to use one or two plants in mass that create a visual continuity, and then the collection weaves its way uh, in. When you're a certified chlorophyll addict, uh, you're usually more is, is better. Uh, but sometimes you step back a little bit and simplify that ground plane and just make some, some nice, comfortable pairings. Oh. Uh, this, is, uh, my, this is my garden. This, <laughs> I paint stuff, as I mentioned. This is an old cedar tree that died in my garden uh, in autumn. And quite by happy accident, looking up through my Japanese maple at my blue tree created one of those tension moments. Now, tension is a term that, that I'll use occasionally for the garden. And when we generally think of gardens, we think tension is not good, right? You don't want to go out in the garden like this. You want to go out and relax. So I'm not talking about uptight tension, worrying about the debates and things like that. That's tension. Uh, the converse of that, tension in the garden, is the tug between elements. And color opposites give us tension. Uh, form uh, compositions uh, and juxtapositions of bold and soft give us tension. This is a good kind of tension because without it, the garden is very boring because you're not challenged. The eye doesn't know where to rest and to pull uh, some kind of view into focus. So tension is important. And for me, this is uh, a tension that I love in my own garden. So let's go through some of the seasons and look at some of the plants that help build a year-round interest in our shaded gardens. So uh, winter, of course, uh, some years is about snow, and other years, there's not a flake to be seen. Uh, I understand from Bob that we're about the same zone, although you're much warmer than I am. I asked him how often he gets down uh, to single digits. He said once every four years. And we're usually about four times every year that we get down into single digits for our garden. So I'm close to a half a zone colder than you are. <coughs> Last year we had a zone eight winter. I'm sure you did too. It was wonderful. Uh, nothing like having a zone eight winter and a zone seven summer. Uh, we should arrange more of those. That would be great. But some years we do get snow, and I'm sure occasionally a flake or two falls here too. I won't dwell on snow too much, and why I love snow where I live is it falls, and then within a day it starts to melt, and it's gone. So you get the, the beauty, and uh, then it, it, gone, it goes. And in going, it creates often really exciting patterns. This is my garden again, the terrace outside my uh, dining room and I love the patterns that the melting snow makes. And oftentimes when we do get snow, it's like this. It's just amazing. And how beautiful and ephemeral that is. Even more ephemeral than most flowers for us. Um, winter has its joys, but it also has its challenges. Uh, is bamboo a problem down this way? You have to deal with deer in your gardens? Yeah. Um, I put up a deer fence uh, in my garden. That's how I deal with, with bamboo. And I got really smug about it, too. I put up the deer fence. I'm like, well, wow, now my troubles are over. And I thought, I have beat um, Bambo and solved all my problems. And before I knew it, within an hour of, of putting up the last link in the fence, the voles came from underground and started devouring me. So I, I forgot the eight-foot fence underground, too. So gardening is, is not for sissies. There's a lot of challenges out there. Uh, a lot of things that are constantly compromising our good intentions and our good design. Uh, our native Calicarpa, a very beautiful plant. Unfortunately, great in the late summer and autumn, but not a good winter berry for us because with hard freeze, the berries brown and drop. But very beautiful on that early snow moment. Winter gives us lots of opportunities to play with foliage, especially in the warmer parts of Zone 7. And I'm fond of saying, other than invasive exotic plants, there are really no bad plants, just bad ways of using them. And Aspidistra, or cast iron plant, gets a very bad rap, but uh, it has a great place, especially in dense shade and dry areas. 
And if you don't want just the plain green one, there's so many amazing cultivars available now. This one is called Asahi, and it's a beautiful white-tipped version that comes to us from Japan. Lots of ways to use plants. For me, what I love about gardening in Virginia, where I live, is save for about four to six weeks, depending on the year, there's always something in bloom in my garden. And I love winter gardening for several reasons. One, it's not hot. That's always good. Two, there's no mosquitoes. Another good reason to garden that time of year. It's a great time to be out uh, and playing around looking at what's blooming. So here is a true winter garden. These are all precocious plants that bloom in the winter time, depending on where you are in January, February, or early March, depending on your zone. We've got a witch hazel, which is the shrub in the center. Winter aconite, a beautiful little ball. Snowdrops, which we can all grow and use. And then there is a, a hellebore. You'll see more hellebores later. Uh, the snowdrops are fantastic for early bloom. Uh, January through March, with selection, you can have lots of snowdrops. This is Galanthus alwesii, the giant snowdrop. If you order dry bulbs, it can be very difficult to get snowdrops established. So order early and specify an early ship date, because especially in the South, the bulb dealers will say, well, we don't want to send you your bulbs to November. And by the time November rolls around, your snowdrops are dried up uh, little <coughs> dust clouds. So specify uh, early delivery, especially for the snowdrops, and soak them 24 hours in water before you plant them. It gets them going a little bit better. Adonis amurensis, the Amaradonis. This is the March Bank at Winterthur Gardens up in Delaware. This is a beautiful little bulb from Japan. It's actually more of a tuberous root. Blooms very, very early, has ferny foliage, and goes summer dormant, so it will tolerate a great deal of heat. I promised Halibors, um, one of my favorite group of winter blooming plants. My garden <laughs> is probably more Halibors than anything else. Uh, not always by design because they seed like crazy as well, but uh, often by design. This is probably my favorite. This is Halibors niger, the Christmas rose. This is a very beautiful form. One of the reasons I love Hellebores niger is very early. It's very pristine white when it opens, and the flowers do face outward. There's a lot of talk about trying to breed Hellebores for up-facing flowers. This is not something we want. We don't want flowers looking up. There's a reason Hellebore flowers gnaw slightly, and that's to keep the pollen dry. Because in the wintertime, if your flower's up facing and your pollen gets wet, then you're not going to be pollinated. And you're not going to set seed. So out facing is okay, but up facing would be a disaster. All those stamens would rot in there and we'd have a nasty mess in the wintertime. But Hellebore's niger is naturally out facing and it fades to a beautiful rosy color and then goes to green. The reason hellebore flowers last so long is that the individual, what we think of as petals, are not truly petals. They're sepals. They're modified sepals that are very colorful. And right inside the flower, see these little green projections? You see a collar of them there? These are the actual petals. And they're reduced to what are called nectaries in hellebore. So they're not uh, very showy. But when we get double forms, the nectaries become petal-like, which is what gives us the doubles. So, an amazing group of plants. There's a lot of variation in hellebores in the wild. I'm always interested in native plants, not just native plants in North America, but all over. So, we traveled to the Balkans to look at hellebores in the wild. And all this variation occurs just in one species. So, it's no surprise that when we start to hybridize these garden hellebores, we get an amazing array of colors and patterns in these plants because the natural variation is incredible. And if someone uh, offers you a green hellebore, do not say, I already have the green one, thank you. Instead, say thank you very much and take another hellebore because this is just one species. And look at the different colors of green here. There's four different shades of green in the flowers of just one species. So there isn't a green hellebore. They're all of the green hellebores, so they're all um, different. This is the source of the beautiful purple and dark black colors that we get in many of the hybrids. This is a wild species called Helleborus torquatus that grows in Bosnia, in 
very, very beautiful. <coughs> very diminutive plant in the wild. I love these wild hellebores because they mix beautifully with our native wildflowers because they're not so massive as the hybrid. <coughs> One of my real favorites, this is a true Lenten rose. We often call hellebores orientalis the Lenten rose, and a lot of our garden hellebores we call them Lenten roses. <coughs> But they're really not true Lenten roses. They're often very complex hybrids. But this one, which is called Old Early Purple, which is an old pass-along plant in the south, is a true Helleborus orientalis of the subspecies of Chassicus. And it is a beautiful little Hellebore. Look, notice those purple-black stems that support the flower. The flower opens this rich purple. And then as it begins to fade, it gets a pale edge and ultimately, the edge turns green and the center of the flower is suffused with purple. So it's very beautiful. Is anyone lucky enough to have this plant in their garden? <coughs> now, it's become very uncommon, but it used to be a fairly common pass along plant in the south. But undeniably, the hybrids are where the excitement is in Hellebore breeding right now. And all these different amazing hybrid forms are incredible. This is a truly yellow garden hybrid hellebore. Uh, Helen Ballard, who was one of the early hybridizers in England of hellebores, uh, distributed what she called her yellow <coughs> hellebores. Uh, if you got any of the early hybrids grown from seed by various people in this country, yellow was really <coughs> a euphemism for cream. And within a few days of opening, your creamy yellow hellebore would begin to turn green. The reason for that is that, as I mentioned, these are sepals, and you know sepals generally have chlorophyll in them. So Kevin Belcher at Ashwood Nurseries in England was able to breed the chlorophyll out of the peduncle, or the stalk, of the hellebore flower. So the flowers can't go green, and so they stay, they're truly yellow. And this one then gets a beautiful rose center put over a true yellow hellebore question. The double hybrids are amazing, and here we see that these were the nectaries have become petaloid, and so you get a double flower. But notice these flowers are still fertile because the stamens aren't converting to petaloids, it's the nectaries. And so we can breed and cross these double hellebores to create amazing uh, doubles. And this one is this one's called Onyx Odyssey. It's a seed strain and it's distributed by a nursery in Oregon, but it's distributed wholesale, and it is on the market now. But it, the plant is variable because it's a seed strain, not a crop. Uh, some other evergreen elements for the garden, the sarcococcus, our sweet boxes, our amazing winter blooming precocious plants. A shrub or a tree that blooms in winter often goes uh, by the name praecox. Praecox means precocious. So if you see the name Praecox on a plant, you know it's going to bloom early. This is Sarcococca confusa, one of the four or five evergreen sweet boxes that we have to work with. And if you've ever smelled this in January or February, it is very, very fragrant. This is one of those Praecox plants. This is Stachyurus Praecox. Um, and what I call it, I put a common name on there. Something tail? Early spike tail. Spike tail. I'd never heard that until I was looking desperately for a common name, and I'd never heard spike tail, which I thought was a great name for it. So these little chains of flowers nod on the bare stems in winter, usually in February. They're slightly fragrant. The interesting thing about most winter blooming plants are either bright white, bright yellow, and or are fragrant. And the reason for this is you need fragrance and a, and a signal color to attract pollinators at a time when flowers are usually few and far between. So you'll find lots of fragrance in our precocious plants. And this one is not overpowering, it's mild, but very nice. And then talk about a signal color, this is one of the canomales of quinces. This is a very deep, deep blood red one, and a very precocious plant that begins to carry us from winter on into spring. Uh, evergreen conifers can also be a very important part of this landscape, and a lot of conifers do fairly well in partial shade, some actually in the full shade. Here you see a, a juniper, a uh, camisiparous, uh, atlas cedar, as we saw before, 
Um, and a very large cherry tree that will give us spring bloom. But this has created quite a canopy over these junipers, so they're growing in a fair amount of shade. This is the winter garden at the Cambridge Botanic Garden in England, which if you're ever over in England and want to see a landscape that celebrates winter, this is the place to go. It's about five acres devoted just to plants of winter interest, and it's amazing. Unfortunately, we can't grow all of them here, but some of them we can. Uh, this is uh, a plant from the West Coast which doesn't do well here, Garia. Uh, but we can <coughs> substitute things like Coralus, our hairy water's walking stick, which also has those dangling clusters, or some other plants. Here's a witch hazel that we can grow, uh, a heather, ornamental grasses, of course, we can do. So some of these plants grow very well for us. And I think what makes this garden so nice is that strong line of the clipped hedge. Not that I would ever do that. I'm much too lazy a gardener, but I certainly appreciate it. At the Riverbank Zoo and Botanical Garden down in Columbia, South Carolina, I was so excited to see hellebores, palm trees, and crepe myrtles growing together. What a fabulous combination. So I went right home and copied this in my own garden and underplanted my windmill ponds with hellebores. I love the look of that. So as we move into spring, this is the Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, which is devoted just to the display of native plants of the Piedmont ecoregion of Eastern North America. It's a very specific focus, yet a very beautiful garden, very much in the landscape tradition, and very painterly and very inviting. A garden in Virginia near where I live, some friends of mine have just a simple woodland trail uh, along the wood's edge filled with wildflowers, blue fox, lots of ferns along a small stream. The Wintergreen Nature Foundation in Wintergreen, Virginia, which is a resort community with a very strong environmental ethic, and the Wintergreen Nature Foundation directs uh, all the uh, rescue of plants within that area whenever they build a new condominium or ski slope. And so they have a beautiful native plant display garden right outside their headquarters. My own garden in Virginia in mid-spring, the <coughs> silver bell that was mentioned uh, when talking about uh, Biltmore, here's the silver bell tree. You see my huge vaulting canopy uh, of giant tulip poplar trees about 80 feet tall. This garden is literally nestled in the woods. In fact, this tree is only about five feet from the foundation, and this one's about three feet. So when the architect built this house, he did what is called building inside the envelope, where you only disturb the footprint of the house. And all the construction materials come in and go out of one corridor so that you don't disturb everything else. The foundation is dug from the inside instead of the outside, so you're not disturbing everything around it. So these trees, with the house is about 30 years old, these trees were nice mature trees when the house was put in. And he was very careful because he loved the way the house sat amongst the forest trees. And we very much tried to respect that. Back to Mount Cuba Center. Um, might seem in Congress to put a Victorian gazebo out in a very wild woodland garden, but I think it works nicely, especially because the roof is uh, shingle, so it, it bridges the gap between the ironwork and the wildness. <laughs> Some great plants for spring bloom. This is Oconee Bell, Shortia glanasifolia, a plant that needs a little bit of acidic soils. It's a southeast native. Unfortunately, the largest uh, part of the population of this plant is now under Lake Jocassi uh, in North Carolina, right on the South Carolina border. But uh, this occurs only in the river drainages that fall off the Brevard Escarpment uh, from North Carolina and flow down into South Carolina. Um, in the direction of Clemson, but a beautiful plant, great, easy to grow in the garden as long as you have a rich, organic, slightly acidic soil, and very precocious, blooming in March, very early spring. Another early spring bloomer, sometimes off, almost a winter bloomer, are the hepaticas or um, liver leaves. This is Hepatica americana, or sometimes now sold as noblest variety americana. And when this one blooms, it often blooms in great profusion. It is an evergreen. Many of these early blooming plants 
are evergreen rather than ephemeral. And an evergreen plant can photosynthesize all through the winter when the temperatures are warm enough. So once the leaves drop from the trees, that plant is still going, making food and storing it, which enables it to bloom early. Dwarf crested iris, iris crustata, in many, many forms, from blues to sky, pale sky blue to white and even purple. Um, easy, easy to grow, clump former, makes almost a solid ground cover in areas where it's really happy. In my garden, this plant always jumps the bed and grows out into the pathway. So I, I walk around huge <laughs> masses of this because it won't stay in the beds where I put it. I love the phloxes for early color. And this is Phlox stolonifera, the creeping phlox, not to be confused with moss phlox, Phlox subulata, which is a sun-loving plant. But this is a shade lover. Many different cultivars in pinks, whites, blues, and purples. Um, very, very common plant. This does form a wonderful, nice ground cover. It blooms just a solid sweep of color for about two weeks in mid-spring. You saw behind it, and now in close-up, foam flower, Tiarella, I think another of our excellent and often underappreciated ground covers. These are semi-evergreen to fully evergreen, blooming very early in the spring, and I think you can see why it's called foam flower. It looks like a nice frothy sea foam. A very un uncommon and underappreciated plant is wood mint. This is Mahania cordata. And the uh, European Mahania is often grown, and it's a very rampant kind of leaper and, and runner. But the native wood mint is more of a shade plant, and it grows uh, much less vigorously, but forms these beautiful flowers, open face, kind of bluish purple. Very wonderful and very underappreciated plant. Mahania cordata. Is it on your list? I yes. It's okay, good. The Solomon's plumes, often called false Solomon seals. I don't like to call anything a false, so I like to call it Solomon's plume. These historically were called Smilocena. They've been renamed to the genus Myanthemum with the Canada Mayflower, which you may know. And they, I think that is an apt change because they look very similar. The upright spikes in mid-spring, and then the beautiful dangling berry clusters in August and September. The ferns, of course, take center stage in summer. They overtop and fill gaps left by ephemeral wildflowers that go dormant. This is the maidenhair fern, Adiantum pedatum, the northern maidenhair. Quite a lovely plant. We also have the southern maidenhair, which is a great garden plant for us. And one that's a little less familiar is the very diminutive Himalayan maidenhair. This is Adiantum venustum. And it forms a tight, beautiful ground cover that's like waves of water overlapping on a waterfall. The trillium species, of course, are all superb, can be a little difficult to establish in the garden, and unfortunately still many of the plants sold commercially or wild collected, but if you can get hold of nursery propagated plants, uh, they're beautiful. This is trillium grandiflorum, the large flower trillium, and it's growing amidst a, a mass of a beautiful primrose. Primroses are very hard for us to grow in the South. Uh, the typical English ones don't, mostly don't do well. Although some of you may be familiar with the Parks series of primroses that have been hybridized by Cliff Parks at Camellia Forest Nursery in North Carolina. And they do a lot better in our heat. But this one does an outstanding job in early spring because it's summer dormant. This is Primula Sibboldii, the Seibold primrose. And it blooms like crazy in the spring. And because it's summer dormant, it doesn't mind that it gets hot. So it's a good one for us. It comes in all different shades of pink and lavender um, and pure white as well. Here's a clump of a white-eyed pink form in my garden. And you see the way it grows, very tight tufts of foliage. But that will completely disappear. So you need to overtop it with a fern or something so you don't disturb it. Here's a white form in my garden, growing in trilliums and foam flower and other plants. Another shot of my garden, the blue fox. I just think blue fox is such a tremendous plant. It's a free seeder. It varies in color when grown from seed. As you can see, all this came out of just one or two plants that were just a, a nice blue. 
and you see pale blue, deep blue, and white. Here's the blue fox again in mass in a friend's garden, growing with a nice color contrast with our native columbine under a beautiful Japanese maple. Here's her garden again, her water garden, and the blue fox is used again, wild geranium, our, our native wood geranium. And if you have a water garden, I love this one is golden club. Has anyone grown golden club, orontium? Great little freaky uh, aeroid for water gardens, but has to be in a pretty moist environment. There are a few crazy primroses that I have some success with. This one is called Jack in the Green. Uh, it's a hose and hose uh, folios flower, and I love green flowers, so I like this one. But it's, it's not real long life. It'll go a couple of years. Um, then they peter out for me. There's that Solomon's Plume again, growing with maidenhair. And how important foliage is at this time of year as we move from the, the wealth of bloom in spring into late spring and early summer. The foliage is really taking over. The color is dying down. The garden's getting more restful. And I almost love it more at this time because I'm not quite so frenzied by all the activity. And the color, as I mentioned, begins to come in through the foliage. It's not just about the flowers. Here's an epimedium called Epimedium acuminatum, one of the barren warts, whose new growth is this beautiful bronzy orange and a golden set, bull's golden set there. So let's look at them at summer. Here's a garden in North Carolina, my friend Mary Jean Baker's garden, where she paints everything and her furniture and her front door always matches. All this now is chartreuse. Um, she's, got, she's over her blue face. Um, like Picasso, she's moved into chartreuse. Summer really is a time of repose and of foliage. This is an, an amazing garden out in Victoria, British Columbia, called the Abkhazie Gardens. Uh, if you get a chance to visit this garden, it's one of the most exquisite gardens in North America. It's built on a granite outcropping. It's just this huge dome of granite with this amazing garden tucked into every crevice and every turn. And it's kind of a romantic story, which I never get quite right. But this couple uh, was originally from Europe. And during, I believe, World War I, they were separated because their parents thought the match um, inopportune. And so as the war hit, they were separated. They reunited in Canada many years later. Both had stayed signal because they, their love for each other was so strong. And they found one another many years later, married as, as older adults, and built this garden together. So it's really an exceptional garden, not just in its uh, physicality, but in its story as well. Here's another view of the garden. Any garden with orbs in it, um, I love. And look at the size of those rhododendrons. It's <coughs> crazy. Uh, ferns are spectacular in the summer garden. Here's a garden in, in Washington outside of Seattle. My friends Ernie and Marietta O'Byrne have another of, I think, one of the most spectacular gardens in North America in Eugene, Oregon. And this is a little vignette from their garden. Just beautiful. Simple path. Of course, statuary and objects of all kinds make uh, great companions for uh, wildflowers and shade plants. This is a staddle stone. If you're not familiar with the staddle stone, uh, buildings in England that usually house grain or needed to uh, be rodent free were placed on top of staddle stones because the top of the stone, the rodent might be able to climb up the base of the stone but couldn't go upside down to go around the mushroom head. So it would keep the granaries and things free of rodents. And of course, now they just make really expensive, but beautiful garden um, art. The garden art doesn't have to be expensive to be uh, useful and to be a focal point and how things work in it, even just dropping containers into the shade garden, whether it's a tree or a pot of color or some tropical uh, excitement to drop in in the summertime, all works. And I love the fact that not just the maple is in the pot, but there's a hosta in the container at the top as well. Some underutilized and underappreciated summer plants. This is Silene stoneta, one of our gorgeous native plants, Staricampium, which is a true summer bloomer. 
Partridge Berry, Michello Repens, another summer bloomer, right down a ground cover that hugs the ground, but these flowers are so fragrant. Just like in winter and summer, flowers are few and far between in the forest, so the flowers are white or brightly colored and often fragrant. And this plant is often called twin berry because the two flowers that sit side by side uh, form one berry. So it's a really interesting little plant. Um, Coming to us from China are this amazing array of mayapples, or podophyllums, the Chinese mayapples.